Good morning or good afternoon, good evening from where you are viewing us. We are going to start in about two minutes just to make sure that we do have uh, more people coming in to view us. So we're just going to give it a, a few more minutes and then we will begin. But we're happy here today from Paragon Testing Enterprises. So my name is Anna Baxter and we have Patrick Macaron as well from Paragon Testing. So we uh, administer the CellPip and Kale tests, but we will be talking more about CellPip today. But if you do have any questions about Kale, which is the academic uh, test for universities and colleges, just let us know. I'll be happy to help out with that. And our guest today, obviously, we are very proud to have Amir here today from AIA. And we'll hear a little bit about what he does, what the organization does. So we're excited to have you here today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and we're just uh, going to give it just a few more minutes, and then we'll we'll go ahead and start with the presentations. So how is everyone today? Hopefully you've had your coffee. I'm still having my coffee, <laughs> but. Uh, I just need a little bit of energy. I know Patrick, he needs more coffee than I do. One for me is enough, but Patrick, I don't know how many you usually have during the day. More than I can count on one end, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm not a very avid uh, coffee drinker, but I prefer tea. And oh, my okay. wife doesn't like it. Yeah, because like every time I'm, I'm asking her to give me the favor. <laughs> oh. <laughs> She's annoyed. <laughs> That's funny. I actually like tea, but I, I think it's more seasonal. Like there are moments where I just want to have tea every day and then I stick to tea and then at other times I just need some coffee. But if I drink tea, I'll drink more than one during the day. But coffee is just once is enough, I think, just sort of to get me going to start off yeah. the day. But yeah. 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 <laughs> OK, so I think we're going to get started here. So, um, Amir, can you give us a little bit of information about your organization and what you do? Well, thank you very much for having me. My name is Amir Ismail. I operate a company, an uh, immigration firm uh, based in Toronto. And I've been in the business for the last uh, several years. I started my immigration consulting career in 1991. And it has been 29 years that I'm uh, working in this field, so you can call me a dinosaur in the immigration industry. I've seen ups and downs in the 90s, 2000s, and now we are in 2020. So it's been a pleasure. It's been a great journey. Uh, so we deal in various uh, categories, uh, immigration, uh, skilled workers, uh, provincial nomination, business, immigration, and temporary visas like students and visitors. So today I'm going to provide you some updates uh, uh, about uh, uh, immigration as to what is going on because a lot of people are a bit confused and they are anxious as well about the uh, updates and uh, given the unprecedented situation we are all going through, uh, people are interested in knowing as to what the IRCC is doing. So um, I have categorized my presentation into three categories. One is the permanent residents, and then uh, the second is uh, the students, and third is the visitors, people who are interested in visiting Canada. So for the permanent residents, there has been a lot of um, uh, anxiety in, in federal skilled worker program applicants, uh, because since the start of uh, the pandemic, March the 18th, when, uh, when uh, Canada closed its borders, um, they stopped inviting federal skilled worker program applicants. But that doesn't mean that Canada was not selecting applicants from the express entry pool. They continued the draws, but all those draws were focused on the provincial nominee applicants and Canada experience class applicants. Um, but then they realized just recently, a week ago, and it's a good news that federal skilled worker program applicants are back in business because the last draw we had last week was all program focused. So all those federal skilled worker program applicants who were feeling a bit neglected, uh, they now can see that uh, IRCC has started selecting them. And I would say they did the right thing because even if uh, they were selecting PNP and CEC applicants, it doesn't really mean 
that they are in Canada because they were thinking that perhaps it's it's a better idea to only focus on PNP and CEC because most of them are are based in Canada and if they select only Canada based applicants they can uh, reduce the uh, COVID-19 impact because you know these people don't have to enter Canada from overseas uh, but that's not true entirely because some of the PNP applicants could be overseas uh, some of the CEC applicants could be overseas even you know so uh, last week was a good news uh, if you are a an applicant who is interested in applying for immigration and um, you are interested in applying for federal skill worker program you can submit uh, one other thing that I wanted to um, share is that even during the time when uh, there were no draws happening for federal skill worker program applicants applicants were still able to create their profiles and they should because if they don't uh, not only they would not be found by the federal government for selection but they would also not be able to be found by a province uh, so a lot of people ask me the question uh, should I apply under express entry or should I apply for the provincial nomination? The answer is that the express entry is not a program itself. It's only a file management system. So if you don't create your express entry profile, just because of the fear that, you know, or out of the concern that you have less ranking score, you have say 400 or 300, and you're not creating it because you can see that the current pass rank is hovering around 430 to 478, 475. You're not doing it, uh, but by not doing that, you're not making yourself available to provinces that are selecting applicants at CRS as low as 300. For example, Alberta uh, continue to do that. And by the way, provinces have also not stopped selecting people uh, under the provincial nomination uh, programs they operate uh, during this uh, this pandemic so things are going but it's only that because IRCC is operating at a very low capacity uh, people can experience delays but we should be out of words very soon because things go normal and uh, things will be okay so that is the update for uh, for immigration applicants uh, for our federal skill worker program so I'm gonna quickly touch base with uh, the other two updates and then uh, I'll uh, wrap up so that you could talk about self -hip. Um The second update is about students and it's the recent update. It came just a few days ago, I think three days ago. And for students who are anxious about uh, starting their um, classes in fall and they have the concern that they would not be able to enter Canada because borders are still closed or they would not get the visa in time. So Canadian government has uh, released new instructions um, that require temporary uh, visa application, application to be submitted online, so they can submit their application online, but the applications will be processed in two stages for students now. So it's, it's a new news, basically. Um, uh, previously, we used to submit the application, we used to get a decision, but now there'll be two stages. One would be the eligibility stage, and the second would be the admissibility stage. And to pass the eligibility stage, students must show that they have been accepted in a Canadian institute, have available funds, and are otherwise eligible for, for a study permit. And applicants who would pass the eligibility will be notified of the first stage approval. They can then start their classes online. So it's a temporary arrangement for all those applicants who are interested in starting their, their classes from uh, September, say. But at that time, they can, of course, begin studying online uh, while abroad and have that time counted toward their post-graduation work permit. Um, so as long as they complete 50% of their uh, coursework in Canada, their eligibility for post-graduate work permit will not be impacted. So it's a good news for all students. Uh, and as I said, the next stage would be admissibility where they're gonna check the uh, you know they would they would require necessary documents to be submitted to check the background security checks biometrics immigration medical exam and a police certificate so so basically that's uh, for for students for visitors uh, uh, no applications were being processed until uh, 1st of July when Canada announced that they might still not be able to issue visitor visas to people 
uh, unless you have a family member here, a close family member here, and you have uh, uh, an essential reason to come to Canada. Um, but uh, for all other people, they are now in a position to submit their visitor visa applications online and uh, they, they will be processed or we can expect delays in that as well, but at least they are in a position to submit the application. It would most likely be that their uh, decision would be rendered once the uh, borders are open. So that is uh, the news for the visitor visa application. So I, I've tried to be as concise as possible. Uh, go ahead, Anna. I just had my microphone turned off right there, but I think what you were talking about with the um, with the opportunities for students to come is fantastic because we do have some additional news that we'll we'll talk about a little bit later uh, yeah. about Kale online, so they might have the opportunity to do it at home. So this is absolutely new for many people. So. Really, Hopefully, really, really, yeah. So we'll we'll give a little bit more a, a, a little bit later. So we'll we'll talk first about Salpip, and then we'll I'll give a little bit of information about Kale just for any students that might be out there that are interested in this as well. So we do have some questions here for you. So I'm just going to go ahead and and pop some questions, and then if later on if anyone wants to ask additional questions, they can. Sure. We do have a chat box available, and I did write a message for anyone who would like to ask any questions for Amir, as well as Patrick once he does his presentation. If you do have any questions about CELPIT, please let us know. And Kale as well, so I'll give you a little bit about that uh, soon. <laughs> okay, so it says, hi, Amir. Uh, please do elaborate. What are the common reasons of refusal in skilled worker category, even when all documents are complete? Okay, so ideally, if all documents are complete, you should be given um, positive consideration by the visa officer. But yes, we have seen... Uh, a lot of cases. I've been seeing them since 91, right? I've seen um, cases where applicants submitted everything, but they were still refused because you also need to take into account the contents of the documents. For example, in my point of view, uh, others can disagree, but in my point of view, um, the biggest reason why a skilled worker application is refused uh, is because the applicant provides, it fails to provide um, detailed documents about their employment. What they do is they claim work experience points. They provide a very simple letter saying that the applicant has worked with the company from so-and-so uh, for so-and-so period, and that was the designation. And they provide they don't provide any details about the job des description, the job duties. Or if they provide the job duties, sometimes it happens so that the, the experience letter is very detailed everything is there but the officer still refuses because the applicant made a mistake in selecting the correct national occupation classification code for their their um, occupation the, the primary occupation basically so uh, it happens all the time so it's very important that when you choose the occupation you have to be careful it has to be noc o a and b and if you have selected the right occupation make sure that your employer is stating the correct job description on your your uh, employment letter. It doesn't mean that you have to have your job description modified because the, the, the best part for Canadian immigration is that they used to have an occupation list and that was working against them. Why? Because people used to look at the occupation list and they used to then modify their CV according to that occupation, if their occupation was not there. But Canadian government, uh, you know, realized that they're making a mistake. They eliminated the list. So basically, there are now hundreds of occupations available. If you are working in an occupation, it's most likely that you would meet the requirements if, as long as the occupation falls under NOC O, A, and B. Uh, but make sure that your employment reference letter is detailed. Um, there are a few more other uh, uh, reasons why the applicant could be refused, but I think given the uh, time we have, we might not be elaborate. But yes, other documents like police certificate, failing to provide police certificate from uh, all the places, especially if you're coming from South Asia, uh, where the police department or police stations are not um, uh, coordinated the way we have in West. So if one police station, if you have resided in one area and you're providing police certificate from one uh, jurisdiction, 
it might be so that you don't have any record of yourself in the other jurisdiction. So the officer sometimes refuses the application saying that you did not provide full documentation. So these are the technicalities people need to take into account when applying. Great, thank you. And I think we have uh, another question from the same person from, Kau I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but it's Kawaja. <laughs> The, the, they just wanted to know if uh, you would recommend someone to create express entry profile even when someone has a low CRS score, say 300 or so. Yeah, most definitely because, you know, if, if you have 300 ranking points, you can safely assume that you would not be uh, getting selected by the federal government because we can see in the last five years we have this express entry program up and running we can see that the score has gone down to uh, the uh, maximum to 413 so basically we know that the uh, the current ranking score is hovering around 440 to 475 or maybe more sometimes uh, but if you have low ranking score your target would be provincial nomination and all the provinces now work with Express Entry. Uh, Express Entry in itself is an online system, right? Um, so if you're not in the Express Entry pool, the applicants would not know you, uh, the provinces would not know you exist. So it's like, you know, if you're applying for a job, if you don't send out your CV to your employer, how would the employer know? You just think about getting that job. You have to take that step. You have to create your Express Entry profile and you are there with 300 ranking points and now you are expecting that a province would select you or there could be a, a province that requires you to take an additional step where not only you you are required to create an express entry profile but you are also required to register with them i'm talking about a pro province like saskatchewan or prince edward island they all require you to create express entry profile and then register with them as well uh, alberta and ontario they don't require you to register with them they don't want you to contact them if you are in the express entry pool and if you mark yes and you gave consent to these province to view your profile you are a potential candidate for them great thank you okay i, mean, I think it's we're still going on with the same person asking just a few more questions so they wow. say as i being a qualified candidate but getting confused in the differences between an agent and an iccrc member like amir and who should we be dealing with well i get this question a lot a lot of, uh, <laughs> you know most of uh, the our clients especially they are overseas and, um, and they uh, and then deal with uh, local agents so in Canada the profession of immigration consultants uh, is regulated and if you're dealing with an immigration consultant make sure that they are ICCRC members not agents because you know ICCRC allows us the members uh, to appoint agents overseas, which is of course helpful because they are in a better position, they are on ground, they can get us business. But some of these would start acting like immigration consultants themselves. They in fact use the term immigration consultants for themselves. And some of them basically use the uh, agreement with the member, the ICCRC member like me, uh, to cover their operations because it's illegal as uh, an agent to pose as an immigration consultant or counsel the client. So this is how it, it goes. If you are dealing with uh, an immigration aid, agent, I wouldn't say immigration agent, I would say an agent, make sure that uh, they are representing an immigration, uh, licensed immigration consultant, and you deal with the immigration consultant directly rather than signing an agreement on the company letterhead of um, that agent. Because in Canada, uh, people are regulated, not the company. So if you want to be safe, uh, make sure that you sign the agreement with the ICCRC member and uh, safeguard your interest and uh, save your dream to come to Canada. <laughs> well, that's good advice, thank you. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're um, <clears throat> excuse me, we're gonna continue on with uh, Patrick. And if you do have any additional questions for Amir or for Patrick, uh, please let us know. Just continue writing in the chat box and we'll be happy to respond to your questions after the presentation. Thank you. All right, Patrick, you have the floor. Go ahead. 
All right, thanks, Anna. Uh, great job, Amir. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm just gonna touch on the uh, self-test, test, um, <clears throat> which is one of the two English tests accepted by the federal government of Canada for permanent residency or immigration to Canada and citizenship. Um, so yeah, we're happy to be hosted today by Amir and his uh, his firm. So uh, we'll get into it. So basically, uh, these are the uh, countries and major cities where somebody can take the CELTIF test. So you uh, you don't have to take it in Canada. Uh, we, we do have all the major cities in Canada covered in terms of uh, where you can take it. Uh, but you can also take it in these other countries um, shown here on the slides. So we do have locations in India, uh, Philippines, uh, the United States. We have a test center in Dubai. Um, so wherever you take the test, it has the same uh, value, so the same uh, validity. <clears throat> uh, just going to get into the uh, main features of the CELTIF test. So it is a Canadian English test. That means that throughout the test, uh, for example, when you're doing the listening section, it is a Canadian voice and accent uh, that you will be listening to. And the uh, English that's used throughout the test will be a, a North American or a Canadian accent and uh, language. So uh, for some of you that might be more um, applicable, familiar, if you're looking to build a life in Canada. Uh, the second point is that the test is computer delivered. So that means that the full test is taken by yourself uh, on a computer um, and it's all completed within three hours. So once you're done, once the three hours is up, you've completed all the sections and then you can, you know, just wait for your results. Uh, the results come out fairly quickly. So uh, in just four to five days after the test, you receive the results. Uh, also, due to the pandemic situation right now, um, submitting your results to the federal government has become easier uh, because we made an agreement with them where they will accept the online scores, uh, which are which is the the first scores that you submit your online scores in your CELTIF account. So you can now download those scores from home and submit them directly to the government electronically. Uh, so that'll save you a lot of time uh, because before you had to wait for the official hard copy score report in the mail. Uh, so now you can download the scores online and submit them, uh, which will be a lot more convenient uh, for many of you. So uh, we have a, a lot of free study materials. We have uh, free instructional videos that are taught by self experts. Uh, you can watch them live. You can watch recordings of them. Uh, we have a lot of free practice tests. The practice tests are the same format of the real test. So they give you a really good idea um, on if CELPIP is the right English test for you for your application. <clears throat> so I'm just going to cover the two main types of CELPIP tests. So the, the top Patrick. one is CELPIP general. Hi, and, Patrick. Uh, yep. I just wanted to just to cut you off. We can't see your screen, the actual presentation. We're not oh. able to see it. So we can see oh, a different. Thanks for letting me know. Let me uh, mm -hmm. check that out. Oh, perfect. There we go. I think I had a setting that wasn't selected. All right. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to briefly show you guys. Uh, these are the test locations. So these are the countries where uh, anybody can take CELPIP worldwide. Uh, so you can obviously take it in Canada, but you can also take it in the United States. Uh, you could take it in India. Uh, we have a test center in Dubai, Philippines, and down there at the bottom is just covering the major cities where you can take the CELTIC test in the world, uh, including all of the major cities in Canada. Uh, as I mentioned, these are the core features of the CELTIC test. So it is Canadian, computer delivered. Um, you get the results in four to five days after your test, and the results can be downloaded now. Um, from your online CELPIP account and submitted electronically to the federal government of Canada for permanent residency or citizenship. So those are the uh, the main features of the test. <clears throat> um, yeah, so there are two types of CELPIP tests. There's the uh, top one is the CELPIP general. So that covers the four components, listening, reading, writing, and speaking. 
Uh, that's the self hip test you would take for immigration to Canada. So permanent residency, um, you know, so express entry, provincial nominee programs. Uh, the test is three hours for self hip general. Uh, you can click through it at your own pace, so you can finish early. You don't have to wait uh, the full three hours if you are finished before that. Uh, the cost of the self of general is 280 Canadian plus tax. So depending on which province you're in, uh, the final price will vary. Uh, the bottom test is called self of general LS, L for listening, S for speaking. Uh, this is the test you would take if you have to take an English test for Canadian citizenship. Uh, because when you are applying for citizenship, so not permanent residency, uh, the government only wants to see your listening and speaking skills. Uh, so in that case, we have a test where you only take listening and speaking. So you don't have to take two additional components, uh, reading and writing, uh, that the government won't consider. So you only take the two required sections. Uh, because it's only two sections instead of four, the test is shorter, so it's about just over an hour long, and the test is also cheaper, so it's about um, one ninety-five Canadian plus tax, so just over two hundred dollars. So uh, just to recap, self hip general is for permanent residency, and the self hip general LS you would take if you're applying for Canadian citizenship. Yeah, so after your test is completed, uh, in four to five days after the, uh, the test date, you receive the results and they will be posted online in your CELPIP account. So when you register for the CELPIP test, you're going to have to go on the, the website, uh, the CELPIP website and create an account. So it's a free account um, with your email and password. So you can sign in and out of that account. So once your scores are available, you're going to receive an email letting you know that the scores have been posted and then you have to go to the CELPIP website and sign in and then you can check your scores uh, from within your account. So <clears throat> uh, this slide is just showing basically the government of Canada. They use a scoring system to determine somebody's English uh, level or proficiency. So they use the Canadian language benchmark level system, which is the CLB level system. So that's how they classify or determine somebody's English uh, fluency. So basically with our scoring system, with the self hip test, we use the same uh, level system as the CLB levels that the government uses. Um, this makes it a lot easier for you to uh, to know if you met the requirement or not for immigration citizenship. Uh, so for example, if you need to get a level eight CLB for immigration, that would mean you need to meet a, a CELPIP level eight. Um, with the CELPIP scoring system, there's no overall or average. Uh, you have to meet a minimum level across all four sections. So whatever the requirement is, if you have to meet, for example, a level seven, uh, that means that you have to get a minimum of seven across all four sections. So you can't have like a, a six or a five in writing or speaking. You have to get the minimum level or higher across all four sections in one test. So just to clarify the scoring system there. <clears throat> so now I'm going to briefly touch on uh, each individual component of the self hip test. So the first component is listening. So you're going you're going to have a uh, computer headset and microphone uh, when you're doing the test. So you're going to be hearing different audio clips and conversations in your headset. Uh, it might be one person talking. It might be a group of people having a conversation. Um, you will be provided note paper when you enter the test room. So this is a good uh, section to take notes. Um, so basically, after you've heard the, the clip or the conversation, you're going to be carried to the next screen and you're going to answer multiple choice based questions. Uh, so you'll be given a score based on how many multiple choice questions you answer correctly because the listening section is multiple choice. Um, so yeah, this is a good time to take notes because you won't know what the questions are until you've finished hearing the audio clip. And this is just showing you here what the uh, 
how the, the screen will look when you're doing the listing section. So it's, you know, multiple choice, choose one out of a possible four answers. The reading section is also multiple choice format. Uh, the difference is, is you'll get the reading passages and the questions at the same time as displayed right here. Uh, so you have the reading passages on the left and you have the questions on the right. So they're, uh, the format is also multiple choice. Uh, you just click the down arrow on those white boxes and you can select uh, one out of a possible four answers. Yeah, so as you can see in the top right corner of the screen there, the because SELPIP is a computer test, it's always going to tell you how much time you have remaining to complete each section. Uh, you do have the ability to click next and go to the next section uh, before the time expires. So as I was mentioning at the beginning, you can finish the uh, test early. So you don't have to wait the full three hours. Uh, if, you're, if you've completed the entire section, you can click next and advance to the next um, screen or component. Uh, the writing section is the third section uh, in the test. So this, uh, this section has two questions. The first one is writing an email. Uh, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with, you know, how to format an email, uh, you know, in today's today's world and, and life. Um, so you will have to frame your answer within a word count range. So, for example, uh, it'll tell you, please keep your response between 150 and 200 words. So you don't want to write less than the minimum and you don't want to go over the maximum. So uh, the good thing is because self of is computerized. It's going to tell you as you're typing how many words you've already typed. So you won't have to do any counting. It's going to let you know, for example, you've already typed 85 words. Um, another great feature, <clears throat> excuse me, about the writing section is that uh, it functions very similarly to Microsoft Word. So when you're doing the uh, writing section, you will have access to cut, copy, paste, and finally, and most importantly, spell check. Uh, so if you misspell or misuse a word on the test, it's going to underline it just as spell check does in Microsoft Word. And then you'll have the opportunity to right click on that misspelled or misused word and it'll give you suggestions. And then you, you choose between the available um, suggestions. So you will have all of those features in the real test uh, available to you. So that will be kind of like a like a helpful aid as you're as you're doing the uh, writing section. So I'll just give you an idea of how the writing section looks. So that's task number one, writing an email. Um, task number two, basically you're choosing between two different options. Um, for example, you know your town is deciding whether to build a movie theater or a shopping mall. So there's no wrong answer, but you basically pick a side and you support why you think option A is better than B or uh, vice versa. So that covers the writing section. Uh, the final section is speaking. So speaking has many different tasks. Uh, I'm gonna give you an example of one of them, uh, but basically every, so the way that the speaking section works is that you're going to be following the instructions on the computer screen and you're going to be providing responses on different topics. Um, so basically you're, you're always going to be given preparation time where you can see the topic and you can kind of formulate or prepare your answer. Uh, you could also take notes if you wanted to, you know, um, refer to them as you're speaking, uh, but you're always gonna be given about 30 to 60 seconds of preparation time uh, when you can see the speaking question. So that'll that'll help you. Um, and then you'll go into the recording time. Um, so, you know, give a full response. Uh, don't, don't give a very short, um, undetailed response. If you're given a minute to talk, make sure you use the full amount of time and give a full response. Uh, so I'll just give you an example here of uh, one of the speaking tasks that you'll be given. So one of them is describing a picture on the screen. Uh, so, you know, in the self hip test, the scenarios, the pictures, they're always going to be familiar, uh, everyday life uh, topics and pictures and situations. 
uh, because CELPIP is a general English test. It's not an academic test. Um, so everybody will find the, the content to be familiar for everyday life. Uh, so in the describe the picture question, uh, you just want to pretend that the person you're describing it to can't see the picture. So be very detailed. Uh, give them an overview at the beginning of what you're looking at and, um, you know, just give a full, full response and uh, you'll be fine. <clears throat> so as I was mentioning at the beginning of the presentation, we have a lot of free content to help you prepare and study for the self test and even just to find out, you know, if it's the right test for you. So we have a lot of uh, live videos uh, which focus on the test as a whole. Uh, some videos focus on specific components of the test, like the speaking section, the writing section. Uh, these instructional videos are taught by self of experts and they're totally free. So take advantage of it. It'll help you uh, to try to attain the score that you're, you're looking to get. We, so I just, uh, just talks about more study tips that we offer on the website. Um, so everybody for attending today, we're going to be giving you guys a free online self if study product. Uh, so it'll give you a lot of different things, but in, in the product, it contains a practice test just to give you guys an idea of how it is to, to take the test with the format. Um, this will help you decide if self if is the right option for you for your uh, permanent residency or citizenship in Canada. Uh, the final point is, you know, just due to COVID, due to the, the times right now, we have adjusted our testing pr uh, procedures, including check-in when you take the test, you know, so there's more uh, space in between test takers in the test room. Uh, we've kind of revamped our check-in procedures to be, uh, to keep everybody extra safe. Uh, we're, you know, sanitizing the equipment even more. Uh, so we have changed our, our procedures to to ensure that everybody's uh, even more safe during the uh, the full testing process. So, all right, that sums up my uh, my part. Well, that was great. Thank you so much for the <laughs> information. I know people were asking about the COVID and I'm glad you mentioned that because that's that's extremely important to know what's been going on, what the process is. And just so that you know, we are making sure that there's enough distance between uh, test takers. So we used to have a capacity of 20 per room. Now there's only eight people taking the test. So we just wanna make yeah. sure that people are safe at all times, but they are required to wear a mask. So yeah. that's one of the things that just to make sure if you do come to the test room, make sure to wear a mask. You will be wearing it at all times, even for the speaking section. So that's just important to to note yeah yep. all right so we do have some questions here uh let's see if i can start off with patrick it says um there are oh this person is from pakistan and they said that there are rumors in pakistan market or pakistani market that the cell pip test is easier than other tests like aisles in pakistan is this true <laughs> That's a great I, question. <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, we actually get that a lot too. I would say, um, I would say, you know what? Check it out for yourself. Uh, it is a different format than other tests. Um, so what I would say is the best way to to figure out um, if CELPIP is the right option for you is to take the uh, free sample test that we have on the website because that's like a a very close simulation of the real test. So that'll help you determine if it's a good option for you and how comfortable you feel with the uh, the format, the types of questions. Um, so I'd recommend you take the sample test. And the study product that we will be emailing you guys has a sample test in it as well. So that'll give you another uh, sample test apart from the one on the website. That's great. Yeah, I think in the case here, there is no correct answer because both tests are different and they're both English proficiency tests. And for some people, maybe some sections might be easier than others. So as you mentioned, like in the listening section, because 
this test is Canadian English, sometimes people might uh, understand it more clearly than listening to uh, English from the UK or from Australia. So there are minor differences between the tests, but it's, it's always best, like Patrick mentioned, to do the practice test just to see which one would be more convenient for you. Because we're never telling people you have to specifically take this test or another test. It's better to one person to decide on their own which one is more convenient for them. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and let's see, it says, what will be my CELPIP score if I score seven in listening and reading and nine in speaking and writing or vice versa? So yeah, that's another great question. Um, so basically with CELPIP, there is no overall or average of your four sections. Um, so anybody that requires or any place that requires CELPIP scores, uh, if it's you know for immigration, citizenship, um, you're going to have to meet a minimum score requirement. So what that means is, if the minimum is, for example, seven, you have to get a minimum of seven across all four sections in one test. So you can't get a six, you'd have to get at least seven. So you're only gonna be given a minimum score requirement to meet, or so you either meet that or, or higher to pass the requirement. Amir, I know that one of the most important questions, like what uh, Patrick was touching upon, is the score that they need. Is there a specific score or do you recommend a specific score that they should receive when doing these tests? Right, so basically uh, for uh, skilled workers, they need to be in the express entry pool for consideration by the federal government or the provinces. Now, the provincial criteria could vary. Some provinces could say that you are okay with 5.5 bands, uh, but then, even if it's okay to score 5.5 Ben in the sense that it's the minimum criteria, uh, it, it's a very competitive program. These programs are very competitive and most people these days are unable to score 475 points. So they are focusing on uh, provincial nomination. So even if you meet the minimum requirement of a province, it would still be a good idea to try your best and get a better score. But having said that, um, because it's required for you to enter the express entry pool for you to be able to apply for provincial nomination the minimum required to enter the express entry pool is six across the board reading writing speaking listening if you don't score that you are not in the pool if you're not in the pool uh, even if the province uh, requires you to score 5.5 you would not qualify because the province would not be able to see you so six um, but again, there are other factors as well. So if you score six across the board, it doesn't mean that you'll be able to enter the express entry pool. You need to score 67 points on other factors like age, education, work experience. So all the combination result in 67 points. You enter the pool and then you are assigned a ranking score, which is different from that 67 points that, that you're required to score to enter the pool. So yeah, I mean, I would say uh, do your best, uh, at least six, to be able to meet the entrance requirement in an express entry pool and see if the, with those six, you are scoring 67 at least to get access. When you mention six, is that six over 12 for CELPIP? Yes, because I, I okay. understand uh, CELPIP and CLB, they, the, the ranking- They are the same, yes. They are the same. Yeah. So six would be six for CELPIP. See, I didn't yeah. know that. That's very yeah. good news. <laughs> so, yeah, so seven is actually um, six for the IELTS. So seven CLB is six for IELTS, but it's easier to understand CELPIP, right? Because six, six, so we understand. We don't have to convert uh, that because uh, the, the ranking system is same, so descriptor. That just makes it easier for people to understand. Now, if somebody were to get an eight or a nine, would their uh, scores substantially change? Yeah, it, it does. Uh, if you talk about the writing and the speaking component, if you score seven, um, uh, you know, from, from the IELTS point of view, it's seven, but yeah, for, for CELPIP, it would be eight. So if you score eight, um, it would get you maximum points in that uh, component. But if you score nine, it doesn't make any difference, or 10, 
it doesn't make any difference so um, uh, speaking and writing but if we when it comes to reading and the listening component it does make a lot of difference when people calculate their points they see that if their score in listening is eight uh, they are good and if they score 8.5 they get better uh, a bottom line but if they score 7.5 in listening for example or, or six in listening their ranking score is damaged uh, considerably so listening and reading components do make a difference um, if you go higher uh, it will be better okay so a, a good recommendation is to study practice make sure that you're you're you have the optimal score that you need <laughs> great now for uh well I, I guess this would be for patrick is online cell pip option <laughs> for all countries <laughs> we we don't currently have online cell pip but <laughs> or no but uh yeah we actually just released our our academic test scale online but yeah. uh for any news with cell pip just keep checking back on the website and we would update you uh, if any changes happen to the test but as of right now unfortunately no no online version of cell pip <clears throat> Yeah, that would be fantastic, but we would still need to get also approval from ICCRC for that to happen. So that would be something we would wait on as well. <laughs> Good. Uh, one more question. I would like to ask uh, Amir, what benefits do I have if I become a permanent resident of Canada? Uh, appreciate if he can ponder on it. Well, uh, as a permanent resident, you get all the rights um, um, that you could think about, like, you know, you get free education for your kids, you get health benefits. Uh, I mean, these are the things that Canada is known for, multiculturalism, uh, and you also get to become a part of a Canadian family at the end of the day uh, after three years. So that's the best part. Uh, but yes, so becoming a permanent resident of Canada, it's, it's a big decision, but I have never regretted that decision and I've never seen anyone regretting that decision. I always appreciate what Canada offers them. Um, it's just great. Yeah, so and I think most families are families of immigrants because I'm second generation immigrant. So my parents are from Ecuador, but I was right. born and raised here and Patrick, he has, you could talk about yourself too. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, I got some Italian in me. Uh, my dad was born in Italy. Uh, my mother's Irish, so I'm uh, yeah, a myself. So, so we don't want our immigrants here, so yeah, and the, and that's the wonderful thing. I mean, even if you're born and raised here, everyone is from different countries. It's it's not just uh, we're from one country. I mean, Canadian means that you're a mix of everything, and it's so beautiful to see people from different cultures, from different ethnicities. I love it. All my friends are from all over the world, and we are polite. Yes, <laughs> and we always keep saying, excuse me, thank you, sorry, <laughs> all the time. That is true. Good. All right. Okay. So I'm going to continue on with the next question. This is, I understand there is no average score for CELPIP, but what will be my CLB level if I get different scores in all four tests? Right as I don't see it's possible to get scores seven or eight in all tests. I, I think they're talking about all modules or all components of the test. Yes, yeah, so so basically the question perhaps is that what if the applicant scores different in different components uh, and what would be the ranking, what would be the impact on the ranking score rather than the CLB? Uh, so if you, um, if you score different, or most of people, most of the people score different in all components, it varies. Um, but it is going to have an impact on your bottom line, the CRS, because the points are awarded according to what your your band score is. Uh, the best would be that you could try different scenarios by going to the CIC website. There is a, a tool available, CRS calculator where you put different band scores and calculate your CRS points um, uh, as an assumption, right? So then you'll get an answer as to what would be your optimal score and uh, according to what your uh, capability is, and then you can increase and decrease. This is what I do all the time. I tell my clients that if you happen to score seven, 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 and eight, 
you would get this much uh, CRS, but um, uh, don't just rely on it. Um, do your best, basically. Don't target seven, uh, target 12 out of 12. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's great information. I mean, I think it's it's always trying to get the highest scores possible to make a difference. And in order to do that, you do need to practice. I think even take a lot of people I know have taken the test without studying, without reviewing, without even looking at the test. And then they're disappointed afterwards because they felt that they did well or their English is is optimal and sometimes that is the case but it's always best to review even for an English native speakers because a lot of people who are applying for PRs whether they're coming from the states or from the UK they still need to take the test as well and many of them who never review it they're disappointed but once you just review it go through it make sure you understand what each section is about usually their scores are so much better so it's good to <laughs> to practice, I think. Uh, yeah. And to give you a little bit of information, and if Patrick can help me out just with the website for Kale, uh, we do have a test, an academic test, which is equivalent to IELTS academic. So this test is called Kale. It's not the vegetable. It's spelled C-A-E-L, but it, the pronunciation is the same. So. Um, the Kale test is accepted by all universities and colleges in Canada. So if this is something that you, if this is one of the paths that you would like to take going through a study, uh, um, uh, a study permit, then you might need to take this test. So if you want to know a little bit about the test, I would highly recommend you go to kale.ca. So in the test here, um, Basically, this type of test is a little bit different from IELTS, and most people usually relate it to the uh, TOEFL test because it's an integrated test. So when you're doing the test, you're not doing everything individually. So it's not individual model modules like listening, like reading, like uh, writing. This one is sort of a combination test. So when you're doing one section, you might be doing a reading section and then speaking about the reading section or you might be doing listening and then speaking about the listening, or there will be another section where it will be about reading and then listening, and then you're writing about it. So this is more based on a classroom setting. So it's like reading a book, and then you might have a class discussion, or you might have to read a book and then give a, a written summary. So it, it's actually made in such a way where it's more skills-based, instead of having to memorize every section of the test. So it's it's more uh, like a class. So it, it's meant to be to mimic what you would do in a regular classroom setting. So it's, it's actually quite uh, an interesting test. And we can also, if you go into our website, you can get a free test just to try it out to practice. I would always recommend to at least know what the test is about to see if that that's something that you would prefer to do and we are also next week we will be uh, making it public to everyone the that we have now a kale online which means that for the first month we're going to be testing here in canada but they have the opportunity to do the test at home but hopefully by august or september we are going to be doing this internationally where people will have the opportunity to do this academic test at home in a different country. So it's a great benefit for many people, especially if you're thinking about coming here to Canada and you're in a different country, but you want to see if you have possibilities to go to any institution here, then that would be an option for you. But again, always try the test, see how you feel about it, and hopefully this will be one of your journeys to come to Canada. Okay, so I have a question about uh, this test because I'll, sure. I'll be, <laughs> be uh, are contacted by a lot of students overseas. Um, so um, I understand this test would be available to international students, uh, to international audience, and they can do it from home. So what is the status now in terms of it being recognized by the Canadian Institute, so is, is it uh, recognized across the board? 
Yes, they are getting all the recognitions right now and all the universities are saying yes to this because we do have a proctor. So when you're doing the test, there will be a live person monitoring your test from beginning to end. So we know that there are security issues involved as well that we want to make sure that the person who's taking the test is the one that will be traveling and uh, going to these universities and colleges. So we make sure that the person is in a room individually. They'll do a 360 where they have to show the entire room. And then once they're doing the test, they're going to be monitoring their eye movement, making sure that they're just focused on the uh, computer. So there are certain requirements and also um, computer specifications because obviously you need to have a good Wi-Fi connection. You need to make sure that your camera is working properly because when you're showing your ID, you will be showing it in front of the camera. So we need to make sure that we're able to identify you and know that that's the person that's taking the test. So there are a lot of uh, security um, requirements that are involved here but we want to make it as optimal as when you're taking the test in person. So we want to make sure that all the measurements have been taken as well. Yeah, so I just checked, um, there, there is a list of uh, institutes that uh, accept Kale uh, mm -hmm. as evidence of your proficiency if you're applying in, for admission. So that's a good news. So it's a great news for all uh, international students. Yes, but uh, it will be made public next week, so we're just waiting upon that. We were hoping that it would be launched this week, but they're yeah. always looking for like going through technical issues, and we have done some testing already with ICCRC students because it is approved for immigration consultant students, so we already have approval from ICCRC for the CALE test for immigration consultant students, so it's really it's a, a step forward for us, so this is really exciting. So we've been testing already with them exclusively, but we will make it public very soon. Perfect. Yeah, okay, so we're gonna continue on with the next question. It says, when will I receive free sample tests that I'm supposed to receive on attending the seminar? Will this be on my email ID? Yeah, so we're going to be following up with everybody. Uh, you should receive it within the next hour to two hours, the email. Uh, and it's going to give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to redeem the sample test. But you'll have to create a free self-IP account, and it's going to show you how to do that. And then there's a discount code uh, we're going to uh, give to you, and that'll be, sorry, to, re to redeem the free uh, study product. So, sorry, two things. <clears throat> Today for attending, we're gonna give you a normally paid study product. Um, so the email will give you instructions on how to redeem it. Uh, the paid, the, the study product we're giving you has a, a, a sample test in it. There's also a free one on the website as well. Um, but basically how to access it will be in the email that you'll receive in about an hour or two. But uh, and that's for any account. So even if you go to cellpip.ca or kale.ca, you will, if you open an account without registering, just opening an account, you will automatically receive a free test, a free mock test. So you can practice it and review it, look at it. So it, it's quite helpful, these tests. And then you'll receive an additional product uh, by email. So that would be great for you to help you study and <laughs> to get you on your way to coming here or staying here permanently. Okay, so I have a question now for Amir. It says, my husband's transcripts are in progress, but I cannot apply for transcripts as Mumbai University isn't working due to COVID. What happens if we apply PR only on my husband's transcripts? Yeah, so if one of the applicants, and if uh, I'm assuming the husband is the principal applicant, and if his transcripts are available, he would be able to secure his ECA, and uh, the ECA of the educational credential assessment of the principal applicant is sufficient for you to create your express entry profile. You can add your own ECA later on once uh, your own transcripts are available and you get your ECA as well. Okay. Great. So are there, if there are any other questions, please ask us <laughs> right now, because we're just waiting on questions. I think that was the last question we have. So we 
might be able to wrap up, but if there are any last minute things you would like us to know, either Patrick or Amir. <laughs> oh, Patrick, you're... I was just gonna also <laughs> say that um, we have been adding new test dates for CELTIP. Uh, there was at the beginning when we just opened testing again after the COVID situation, there was a lot of demand. So a person couldn't get a test date until September because every it was fully booked. Uh, but we just have added new test dates for July and we are extremely hopeful that we will continue to add test dates um, you know that you can take the test this month next month so just keep checking back on the website but right now we do have availability in july uh in uh the greater toronto area great that's good information to know <laughs> and just to i have a, a quick question i think for amir it's just to continue what uh, you were talking about just now it says if i don't put transcripts at all will i be able to work in canada so I'm assuming the applicant is overseas and they wish to apply for immigration. A husband has the transcripts available. They're going to go ahead with the ECA for him, but uh, it's not available for her right now. They're going to create the profile. They're going to get selected. Um, you need to provide the ECA only if you um, are uh, uh, claiming points for the education factor. But having said that, uh, when you are applying and if you're accompanying your husband, it is important for you to provide a complete uh, complete documentation. So even if you are not claiming points in education factor because you did not get your ECA, um, when it comes to reviewing the application for completeness, they would see that you do have a degree, but you haven't provided the transcripts. So the application goes into the risk of being returned uh, unprocessed. So it's always good that you do. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the work in Canada because you start working in Canada after you have become permanent resident. So you have to go through that, that procedure, come to Canada, and of course you'll have your transcripts with you when you come to Canada, right? Great, thank you. All right, so thank you so much for all this. And if you have any last words, Amir, for us, uh, <laughs> the audience. Um, uh, I yeah. should add. Um, it's really great. Uh, you guys are doing a great job. It's, it's a Canadian brand, so you know, being a Canadian citizen myself, I appreciate that. And yes, I would actually acknowledge the fact that uh, people applying, uh, they perhaps find um, the, the Canadian accent or the North American accent more, um, I would say, easier to understand um, rather than as compared to a British or Australian accent. Uh, and yes, it's a very organized test. I've been um, promoting it uh, since the time you guys started. And uh, because most of my clients come from India and Pakistan and uh, UAE. So it was great step that you started a uh, test center in Dubai. And a lot of people from Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad, uh, because you don't have any test center in Pakistan, right? So they were taking flights all the way to Dubai to appear in test. And they were very satisfied. Wow. It's a great uh, test, test uh, system. That's great to hear. Great and to hear. UAE, yeah. we also have a test center there, so that's good. <laughs> that's Hopefully, it. we'll be expanding more. I mean, that's that's the the goal for us is to yeah. add more test centers in other locations. But again, due to all the circumstances that we're living in, it's been in pause for the moment, and hopefully, we'll be able to reinitiate once uh, we are able to. <laughs> Hopefully and soon. thank you. Yes, and thank you for joining us. If you do, if you would like to contact Amir directly, um, you can see on the screen that his information contact is there. If you would like to contact us, we also have the info at cellpip.ca. You can ask us any questions you would like. If there's any additional information that you would like to know about Cellpip or Kale, please let us know. But it has been a great pleasure having everyone here today, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, thank everybody. You, Amir. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. Have a great day or evening. <laughs> Enjoy. Bye.